Okay, so when we began, we chose this image. So we began looking at the image of Amy Hubbard. She's from Winmarley in the Blue Mountains and had recently lost her home during the bushfires. While analysing the image, we had a, came across like um, list of words that came to mind associated with disaster, especially nas ash uh, natural disasters. And these are the main words we came up, but we tended to focus on desperation, loss and helplessness. We wanted to create something that transformed those words to move from devastation to renewal. Um, so we explored form as a type of protective shell, something to turn the focus inwards and away from the devastation and to process the situation. Um, I might actually just turn our video back on. If you can see that. So the shell acts as a message board, gathering messages of love, support, hope, and encouragement. Um, mm -hmm. uh, th these shells are given to the victims of a disaster, um, sort of focusing on the gentle gesture of giving and receiving. Um, the curved form fits delicately inside the palm of a hand, um, cradled by the holder who is drawn in to focus on those inscribed messages. The thought is that those who watch or hear news of the devastation unfold and helpless and feel helpless to do anything can share a message of support with the victims. This gives a small opportunity for renewal while the recipient, the recipient is connected to those not necessarily close geographically but from faraway places as well. They are known, they, <laughs> they now, they know they are thought of during the difficult stages of grief until they reach renewal. It is a small way for people to come together even when they're apart, no matter how far. So we envisage the shell to be made of a delicate material, something like ceramics or porcelain um, glazed in a vibrant white as a direct contrast to the blackened and burnt landscape that you see from the fires. Um, it's sort of like a shining hope amongst the darkness, if you like. Um, the clay is also a symbol of the earth and refers back to the idea of renewal. Um, you could also consider local artisans being called upon to produce these um, shells, like another possibility for renewal. So for our site, rather we thought that the location is not so much geographical as in a large structure. Instead, it is in the palm of your hands and the hearts and minds of those affected. The shell is to act as an enabler, allowing people from all over the world to be writing messages to those affected, a small gesture to, the, to bring the world closer together. So the project aims to relieve crisis by drawing the focus away, even for a moment, from the actual disaster. Um, the tactile and fragile quality of the shell sort of forces you to slow down and focus on that gentle curve in your hand. You can just really imagine like holding this thing, um, sort of a way of contemplation and mindfulness. Um, so we focused on touch as the primary sense in this proposal, um, something we feel is a bit less explored within architecture. Um, the experiential so of holding the form in cupped hands, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to put into words. Um, so we imagine too that this could be experienced in silence, um, just for yourself reading these messages, um, but it's not necessarily something you need to do alone. Um, and because it is such a personal experience, you know, if it was families, maybe you could imagine them reading out the messages out loud. After the renewal, the shell remains um, a little memento to be kept throughout life and carried through the stages of renewal as an ever-present reminder of the hardship that was endured during those times. The shell is a type of shining light, a reminder of the positive and support of others and could be referred to back to when um, difficult times arise in the future. You can sort of see it's just like a little little memento on the mantelpiece that you, you can remember the situation. Um, and to finish, we 
Well, we focus on the bushfires. We do imagine that this proposal is applicable to a range of situations, um, just a mechanism to show support to others around the world. Um, through the shells, we hope to offer renewal through collective messages of hope and support. And that's us. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think we have two minutes um, for the, the jury to have a, have a talk. So if you guys want to go ahead, um, go straight for it. Uh, <clears throat> and we can't hear you. Oh, thank you, Steph and Brad. That's a beautiful idea. Can you hear? Yeah, we can hear you, Patrick. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's really nice to focus on something small and uh, beautifully crafted and, and tactile that has, has really clear um, conceptual clarity. What do you think um, the legacy would be um, ongoing? That, um, can you expand on that, that it sits on the mantle? Um, Just as something that all through life, whenever you come across hardship, there's always, you can always reflect back on yeah. almost like your darkest days and that you know that things are going to get better as well. And just like being reminded too that, like, you know, as humans, we always, we, we naturally have empathy, I think. Um, and so, you know, you saw just massive outpourings um, of support, like in the summer. Yeah. You know, people who weren't, impacted but just sent messages and I think that's a really nice thing just to be reminded that you know we are all sort of supporting each other um, even when sometimes it doesn't seem like that you know you can sort of forget things Hi everyone, I'm Li Su Shan and the title of my design is called The Reviving Point. Uh, I'll try to see if I uh, this, um, okay, can everyone still see my screen? Yeah? Yeah. All good. All good, thank you. So the chosen site for this design proposal is a fire destroyed New South Wales bushlands. Though a year has passed since the start of the Black Summer bushfire, the loss and damage caused by the disaster are still very fresh in our memory. With this design proposal, I intended to offer hope for those who still live in terror and grief because of the bushfire. Meanwhile, the design is meant to remind every one of us what has happened. So we will do what we can to avoid another disaster like this. The initial concept is a water tower in the form of a burnt tree trunk. It is inspired by a new story of a wombat who shared the water hole it dug with other animals during the drought on a New South Wales farmland. I made a clay model for the design in a similar way like how a wombat digs into the earth. I propose to mix this installation with terracotta and it is treated with a special kind of glazing. The glazing layer cracks during the burning process and when it gets burnt again in a lower temperature than the previous time, more cracks will appear. After this installation gets placed in the bushland, it might encounter another bushfire and it would record the fire on its body like everything else in the bushland. I pro uh, yes, this installation collects water during a rain season and makes use of underground water source in a dry season. Animals and birds living in the bushland will gather around and drink from this water installation. These diagrams show the recovery process of a fire destroyed bushland. So at the beginning, it's just the black burnt trunks, nothing else. And a year after the tree trunk started to cover the by green leaves and with the water installation placed, animals started to gather around it. And then a few years later, 
the trees are better recovered and more animals will appear around it. Sorry, I'm just going to stop have... you. Sorry. Um, we can't see your slides moving if you're changing them. Um, uh, it's on the second one. No, it's still on the, the first page. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh... Okay, now, now it's working, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, no, it's all right. I'll just make it smaller. So yeah, that's the, like the ring water and the underground water connection I was talking about. And now I'm talking about like the site. So like the site, it's just black tree trunks at the beginning after the bushfire and then they started to cover by green leaves a year later and the installation will attract animals around it and then a few years later the trees are better recovered and then like more animals will gather around the water hole and to help rehabilitation of the fire destroyed bushlands, the reviving point can be multiplied and connected. This recovery process shows how resilient the nature is and it gives people hope for recovery. And, um, And during this pandemic and even before the pandemic, people started to say the words through live streaming. It is possible to install monitoring cameras to live stream the animal activities around the reviving point. So more people will connect with the bushland and care about the bushland. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. We are PNK um, unlicensed architects. Um, <laughs> that is Christian, that's Nicole, and I'm Theo. Um, we first like to um, introduce the image we've chosen for this brief, and I'll hand it over to Christian. So, oh, go back. oh crap. That's a turkey. Um, it's Syrian. It's Syrian, the refugee yeah. turkey. Okay. So the single image that awakened the world of Syrian refugee crisis remains indelible. Three year old Syrian Alien Kurdi lying face down on a beach in Turkey. The boy's lifeless body was washed ashore after the boat carrying G and his family, what they had trusted would be a big start in Greece, outside. The photo physically shows no aggression, violence, evidence of war or the struggle and displacement of the innocent people caught in the heart of the conflict. Yet it is so powerful, epitomizing all that is wrong with the war and so many more like it. It triggers the most basic of emotional instincts, highlighting how apathetic and desensitized we have become. And so we propose a message, a manifesto, a revelation. We are confronted with a world that has imploded from the cruelty that mankind has become. An earth ravaged, mother nature exploited, peoples divided, faiths polarized. At this desperate juncture, our senses are shaken. Fractured fragments of political upheaval, civil unrest, starvation, human conflict, never ending war and carnage. Products of man and his ego, and the ongoing struggle for survival, and the perceived need to dominate. The remains of our modern world that promised a utopia, but is in fact broken and incomplete. A promise that has graduated to a wasteland of futile destruction. Pushed to its edge, life on Earth teeters on the brink of extinction and human despair. These extremes cause the systems, system to crash. What did we miss? Our manifestation represents the change we seek in the, global, in the global psyche. It has begun a unified rebellion, reflecting on the current state of the world to reclaim lost time to the earth 
Mother Nature. It heralds a pause in the race, a halt in the hunger for more, because faster, richer, greater is not winning. It comes at a grave cost to our humanity. We neglected the brilliance that emerges from the cracks, the in-between space. We forget to see the beauty within the joy. We envision a spiritual epiphany, a call for a shift in collective consciousness to alleviate suffering. One that transcends beyond the mortal self, above our fears, content, vulnerability. It seeks to emancipate souls from their codependence on social material. Instead, it is time to rediscover our humanity to foster enriched, meaningful, empathic livelihoods. Spaces for creativity and nurturing, diversity, healing, reparation, and reconnection. We wish to rekindle the essence of who we are, distinct from the automated robotics of our sterile creation. To harness the good from our wreckage of smarts, to find a deeper respect for each other and the world at large. Our message is a defiant reclamation of lost dreams, hopes and trust, remembering our humility as a counterpoint to the suffering, to initiate discussion, to mobilise empathy. Thank you. Today we'll be, our textual proposal is in response to the Black Lives Matter um, movement at the moment. Um, basically from everything, like from our understanding, we've definitely come to realise that it's definitely not a um, geographical issue, but it is a societal issue. So our response to that is um, more at the human scale as opposed to like a geographical or a sense of place. Um, so yeah. Oh. Uh, we were really inspired by this image of the memorial for George Floyd um, and this idea that the community can gather around and look inwards at each other and recharge from each other um, and with this kind of shared grief and shared trauma so that they can then, you know, process this grief and then go out and um, protest and rally and have vulnerable conversations that take a lot of, you know, emotional um, energy and resilience. So we really admire the role we really see the importance of the role of the memorial and the, ro the role of processing grief um, in the kind of activism timeline. Yeah so uh, we took this idea of that architectural response to be a global phenomenon instead of just uh, place specific or event specific so mm -hmm. yeah we really like the idea that this all these architectural responses are connected and inspire hope across a, you know a more wider community. Um, so, like, for example, in, in Sydney here, you've got four of these, these responses that all connect together and, um, you know, it creates a sense of your own space within a, a, wider, a wider community as well. And uh, we've got Musgrave Park here in, in Brisbane. Um, but just showing, for example, yeah, um, so that's sort of, yeah, the beacon, that's what we've on with this one, one set. So uh, the beacon is defined by these elements that we've got up here. So we want the beacon to provide a place of safety and sanctuary, um, some community within the city defined by these thresholds of structure and light. We also want to harness that power of community to offer itself as that place of renewal and recharge. The spotlight from the beacon will connect with people beyond that immediate impact of the form. It will be a reminder that the people will endure the people will be standing together with you, for you, calling across the city, as well as sparking curiosity amongst others to bring them to the site. Uh, the Beacon will also facilitate the sharing of information through storytelling and history sharing and be a place of positive, informed education. Then again, with our connection across multiple points, so it'll be across your city, across the globe, across your community groups. And finally, it must have an enduring presence. It has to have the potential to evolve beyond this single political moment. A reminder of the struggles that have been faced, the battles that are being won and lost, uh, the function will evolve into the future. Um, perhaps we're coming a place of storytelling, shared remembrance, like a memorial back to the past, like we did it, remember when we had to, you know, the struggles that we faced to get here. That, yeah.
everything thank that's you it. okay very interesting presentation I was just wondering uh, you showed you showed different forms for the beacon and I was wondering what to yeah the, the different forms that you pr you're proposing yeah, yeah so um, another key idea was because it's so global um, that we're going to use response materials and responses that are locally sourced like um, we just used like steel for America, um, brick for England and timber for Australia. Sort of as like, you know, representation, representation yeah. of what they could be, but it's just more of a framework yeah. it's, it's to a, a solution. Concept rather than a physical module. Yeah, of yeah exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's not like, intent yeah, than yeah. yeah. So you don't have to place this specific form to represent this. It's like the framework, what represents your struggles to you at this moment. Yeah. Because exactly. I have people like this is nothing. Like it needs that community activation, it needs that community to come together for it. And yeah. we think that considering the power of the movement and the momentum of the movement, like this would be something that would draw people mm. to that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Same. Yeah. You go. Uh, I was just going to say, I was wondering about whether you thought about um, the specific locations where you would place them, like yeah. whether you could actually place these in locations that have a stronger mm -hmm. tie to... Yeah. Um, those kind of movements or not? Yeah. yeah, so on the map, actually, the locations that we had um, chosen were places where, like, statues have been torn down recently um, in the movement that represents, like, statues of oppressors and things like that. Mm. And it's that idea of, like, reclamation of those spaces. Um, and also for Australia, um, for Brisbane, we put Musgrave Park because yeah. we know that that has been um, very a much, yeah, a centre yeah. for activism and for the community mm. um, regarding that but yeah and, the, sorry. and this park here is actually it's a uh, Phelpsfield Park which is I think a couple of blocks down from the memorial that we showed at the very beginning which the uh, movement has been using um, for rallies and the start of rallies in uh, Minneapolis. Interesting that you um, when you talk about a global context for this it starts to introduce not just Black Lives Matter, but as a representation for lots of other cultures that are marginalised. Yeah. Yeah. And if you stay, you go globally, then how would you adapt it for different locations? So I think I just can't recall exactly on the map, but most of them seem to be Western democracies. Yes. Um, and how would you adapt that in Asia, for example, the Rohingyas or in Africa, or all that sort of stuff. So I think when you go global, you sort of start to think, well, what where do we, yeah, how can it be reinterpreted or how can it be adapted in a global yeah. situation yeah. for, for all have, different cultures? Because you probably would have a pro probably more of a focus on specifically the Black Lives Matter, yeah. Yeah. which yeah. has come from like back, or going back like, you know, 400, 500 years to like the slave trade and those like Australia, the UK, and America, mm -hmm. all the yeah. large hubs for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there's, there's nothing but, yeah, saying. There's nothing that saying. This couldn't expand. Yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, our focus yeah. was. Specifically there, but yeah, you make a very good point. Situated at the mouth of Long Island, Hard Island is a creepy, secluded, and desolate place. It is, in fact, a ghost town largely inaccessible to the general public. In its dark history of more than 300 years, the island has played host to prisoners of war, famine victims, epidemics, pandemics, hospitals, a mental asylum, a homeless shelter, a jail, and over one million unnamed, unmarked dead bodies. 
The bodies are buried in trenches three feet underground in groups of threes. These shallow graves can sometimes present grim and grisly scenes. Sometimes erosion can uncover some of the remains exposing bones by bringing them to the surface of the soil. Largely due to this reason and the fear of contamination, Hard Island had been notoriously inaccessible to the general public for the most part of its history. Even family members of those buried were generally forbidden from visiting the graves until 2015. Hard Island is like the setting from a horror movie. Known as the Island of the Dead, it's a jarring and spooky place set only to get worse in the midst of the coronavirus outbreak. Let's hope the spike in the number of burials doesn't last too much longer. COVID-19 was something that we never expected. No one was ready for a global pandemic and no one had prepared for the effect that it would have around the world. Due to the sudden impact of this deadly disease, we began to see a rapid influx of victims, accompanied by insufficient preparation and time to consider their burial process. Many people have been buried on Heart Island alone and without their families. We feel great empathy towards these victims and their loved ones. We have aimed to create a place that represents how big of an impact these people had while showing the rest of the world they are still honored by the community. So our design concept encompasses light to form the structure of a tunnel above ground, spanning the length of Heart Island. We want people to experience Heart Island and feel empathy, empowerment, and determination to stop the spread of this pandemic and encourage people to work towards preventing them in the future. The light energy produced will be generated from decomposition of the bodies using microbiofuel cell technology, where the decomposed are converted into electricity using bacteria. We found this an extraordinary and powerful way to honor our respects to those who have lost their lives to COVID-19, while also creating a sense of affinity when people walk through the tunnel to realize that it is powered entirely by the victims themselves. The access point to the tunnel will be through man-made portals that act as a teleportation device between New York City and Heart Islands. We decided to use portals due to the unsafe nature of the island currently, with strict restrictions on visitations. This way, civilians will be able to gain access to the island without ever coming into contact with it or being unsafe in any manner. Along the inner walls of the tunnel, the names of the known victims will be displayed and facial recognition technology will be presented to reveal their appearance in current time as if they were still with us today. This proposal is meant to heighten visitors' sense of empathy for all the victims, while also helping family members or friends grieve those who they have lost. The tone of life revivifies Heart Island with a perpetual and sustainable light powered by the respective victims. We aim to give the victims a chance of renewal where each beam represents their identity and place in the world, regardless of their current state. We would, like to end our, we would like to end our presentation with a quote from the New York City Mayor, Bill de Blasio. He stated, the picture of our fellow New Yorkers being buried on hard islands are devastating for all of us. I want to make sure everyone knows that what they are seeing and what is actually happening on hard islands. Remember, these are human beings. These are neighbors we've lost. There will be no mass bureaus on Heart Islands. Everything will be individuals and everybody will be treated with dignity. We thank you and appreciate you taking the time to listen to our proposed concept. Well done. Thank you. Well done. Um, Jerry, well, um, two minutes of feedback. That's for your turn, Anthony. <clears throat> Um, no, I think that's pretty clear. I didn't quite understand the uh, portal issue. Is that a was that how you get to the island? Is that is that what you were? 
Yeah, so we wanted to have a, um, a portal access from New York and then it ends obviously on the island because at the moment it's quite unsafe to travel there so people can get sick because of um, like oh, all the bodies that are there. So we wanted to find a way that they could be present on the island and get there while staying safe while they're visiting because we still want them to obviously go and experience it. So what's the difference between going in portal and... Pardon? Boat? Why is it any safer, I suppose, going through the portal? Um, well, we just feel because it'll, the, the, the tunnel that the portals are connected to will be above ground, so they won't actually have to travel to the island physically. They won't, like, come into contact with the ground or the bodies. So they'll be, like, like in this, in this light tunnel, they'll be protected from everything, but they'll still actually be there. So we just felt like it was a safer way. Right. Okay. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. If I could. Um, I, just thought, uh, I thought it was a very evocative presentation, and mm. I like you um, uh, humanised, I guess, the sort of future technology aspect of it. That's all I had to say. Yeah. It wasn't a question. No. Thank you. I was really taken with that kind of circle of life. I mean, it's a bit, um, we don't, we don't um, acknowledge or, or um, our, our perceptions of death in, uh, particularly in, in Western countries is, is quite hands off and quite sort of removed. We don't do death particularly well, I don't think. Um, and so something like this pandemic has really brought home how you know fragile life is so the fact that you've got this idea of that you know the fact that the people who have gone are actually powering the light within the tunnel is is um kind of makes us face up to our mortality in a way that i don't think we often do so that was interesting yeah thank you so much hi everyone we're the goodwins and uh we're gonna present our proposal uh, which is the the Mu show. So um, initially, we started by um, exploring the notion of space. I mean, place. Sorry, and place is not confined to a location. Place is a space bounded by time, in connection to experiences and our sense of belonging. Our proposal's concept is not confined to a location, but rather set to the location's criteria. And um, so uh, there's, there was always one question we always came back to during our uh, process is um, what will we do if we knew this whole pandemic uh, regarding the coronavirus and other things uh, was going to happen? And the answer to that is limitless, making time for friends, families, enjoying the outside world, not taking things for granted. And um, as individuals, we tend to forget that uh, uh, other people have a life as vivid and complex as we do. In a way, we live in our own personal bubble, isolated before the term even invaded us and the rest of the world. And so our process started by not analyzing the site's complexion, but rather the feeling that it books and what triggers. And Things follow such as desperation, hopelessness, a sense of fear, emergency, you can name them up. But we, we figured out a pattern where we might reverse the script. And what we tried to do was uh, create a content where we put the, uh, the pictures of the pandemics first before we put the uh, pre-pandemic pictures, which would evoke a totally different feeling uh, from the before and after pictures. And this in turn will create a sense of being hopeful and a refined sense of a uh, reimagined future. And we've established our concept into three variables, which is reminisce the past, reflect the present, and reimagine the future. And our focus is to stimulate visualization content of the future. In other terms, a reimagined ideal future. And this poses questions for us. Um, how did we communicate? How did we balance our 
life activities, interactions with communities? How did we breathe air? And currently, how do we feel about these questions? And as a way to visualize our project, we chose New York as our platform. And New York is experiencing this pandemic worse than most in the world, along with uh, the ongoing racial protest and other things. Um, as a, a big city in the US, the city is characterized significantly for its social street life, and it keeps the city moving, literally. And there's a core value to the streets of New York that has been obviously been taken away due to the current climate of the pandemic. And so with our proposal, uh, we wanted to get, uh, enable a sense of unity in people. And we wanted to give the ability to experience this event uh, uh, in togetherness and also experience it in, uh, pri in their own private spaces. And the purpose of the event is to answer the continuous question again, what would we do if we knew? And all the trigger intent is uh, as a reflection and reminiscence. The manner in which we chose to evoke these emotions uh, is executed by skylight visuals, uh, sky content projections and street projections uh, of altered past and reimagined future. And this event is not confined to a place or it as it is adjusted to um, uh, the location that we adjusted to. And the street uh, projections are meant to visualize the ideal future, um, altered past, which would visualize the alternative social life of New Yorkers in a manner uh, in which heightened awareness. Uh, furthermore, this will also project the street life of New York, discarding our old isolated and ignorant mindsets. And uh, the street projections taken form as a message uh, behind the beauty, form, and beat of this event. And the projections allocated in the skies uh, will also include light shows as a form of beauty and form, followed with um, symbiotic music as a, as a beat to it and a platform to share stories uh, along with past delighted memories of uh, participants and people. And the purpose of uh, it being put in the skies is to evoke togetherness from the confined individual spaces and to also capture a direct sensation and uh, enforcing a reformed state of comfort and a hopeful continuity of a of a future past this whole pandemic. And um, this is the small visual representation of uh, our proposal with um, our own composed music. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go first this time, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, the Goodwoods, for that presentation. Um, uh, beautiful concept um, and beautiful idea about expanding people's experiential sense of their empty cities. I think a concept that's quite new to all of us whether or not your city is incredibly dense or whether or not your city is incredibly small. Um, can you explain to me a little bit more about conceptually how, how it works? Um, the presentation was, was great and I really liked the image at the end, but is it the idea that people could essentially um, individually interact with this idea and, and upload content and, and um, I guess give their own sort of interpretations or is it something that they may be able to interact with as an overall sort of element or, or how do you see that working? 
So and who, who um, controls this? Yeah. <laughs> say that again. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, it's like an alien being. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, from a from a control perspective, I can see it really working. But how did you envisage that you would be able to interact with it? Yeah. Um. So the idea of it is um. The the holo the holographic projections on the streets should be um, interactive with the people who are around, so that people who have access to devices uh, who doesn't have access to devices also can experience with the whole in the whole event. Mm -hmm. But um, but then people who have the devices um on their hands, they can like so it's supposed to be like some sort of like app where they can download it and then they can agree on forming the event and then um, if they want to share some of their stories just to evoke like happy memories with everyone they can upload it and then if they want to get interactive with people on the streets where they they, they them themselves at, are at home they can just upload like a, a visual like scan of themselves and they can like project it onto the streets and the other idea is also um it's usually more um fun if you experience all of this with your loved ones but then if you are isolated from them you can actually connect with them through the app as well and have like um if you look back at the um final at the last um image it's um so they have like a holographic version of their loved ones next to them and they're experiencing it at the same time with them um yeah so that's basically the concept of like having that app yeah and then um with um with the sky projection as well it's uh that is where we project the stories of um anyone who wants to share share it so it's it can be customable, but most um most of it will be like controlled by um it's not most like half it will be like half and half. So um half of it will be controlled by the event organizer, like depending on how they understand the location livelihood is. And then it, but at the same time it allows inputs from the participants of the events. I'm Caleb. And I'm and, Nadia. Yeah. Um, and our project is titled Ceremonial Shards. So this was our chosen image and we felt gravitated towards this because of the solemnity. From the onset, we were amazed at how much glass had been shattered. The presence of coloration in the glass meant that there was a mixture of stained glass. We also recognised that this place was a mosque. Therefore, a delicate amount of craftsmanship would have gone into the glass and the highly patterned carpet. The trauma, we believe, was the loss of place and worship and congregation, a place where there was regularity. When people are faced with tragedy and uncertainty, consistency and normality generates a sense of safety. The man collecting the glass as a first effort to renew the place is what piqued our interest. We questioned where this glass was to go or what he was going to do with it. The ancient Lebanese were pioneers of glass. Though they had not invented it, they had revolutionised it through mastery of glass blowing, Their glass craft was so highly prized that ancient Lebanon was spared incursions from neighbouring countries. Due to the industrialization and globalization, imported cheap glassware had destroyed their cultural legacy. In the 2006 Israeli war, their glass manufacturing and recycling plant was destroyed. This factory produced green glass bottles for local industries and recycled glass sorted from the garbage. Lebanon was in a state of turmoil before the explosion of the port. Thus, this probably wasn't the first time the windows had been shattered in Lebanon. In present times, there are only a few who still practice the ancient craft of glass blowing, salvaging glass from trash. We feel helpless here in Melbourne and are cautious of creating unrespectful solution architecture. But with hopeful eyes and optimistic actions, we see the explosion of the Bay Report as an opportunity to recast a forgotten legacy through a renewed lens. Shattered glass throughout the blast site is collected and reforged into ceremonial objects using traditional Lebanese glass blowing techniques. The gravity of these objects begin to erode with their continued use. However, their ability to memorialize the event will not. We believe that a renewed state of mind is not one that forgets the tragedies and trauma, rather that it is a state of acceptance. Only then can we move on and learn from our past.
Though the collection of this glass is the start of the healing process, we are interested in the effect of everyday interaction with these ceremonial objects. Unknowingly interwoven into the way we interact and think lies our response to tragedy. The resulting consideration then becomes largely focused on acceptance. Therefore, our proposition is not an architectural space of collection, but rather gradually disappearing ceremony, which takes place every day with these possessions in hopes to aid a personal a process of renewal. Our proposition is a ceremony that takes place in a familiar domestic setting, where the use of these objects are at first perceived as a sacrament to acceptance. These sequential scenes are a narration of the ceremony with everyday objects transmuted into glass. As a consequence, we begin to question our behavioral response to this transmutation. Intrinsic qualities of glass inspire awe and sense of preciousness. For those unaffected by the Beirut explosion, this idolization raises discourse around sustainability of everyday paraphernalia that pollutes our environment. In many cases, these possessions become unrecyclable and contribute to the growing waste management problem in Lebanon. White noise of glass tunes chimes in the wind, breaking deafening silence after explosion. So fragile are our awareness of the inside and out, with only an ephemeral pain separating the two. Our contact with the world and our understanding of our own relation to it is framed and mediated by the windows of our home. Beauty and banality. Unknowingly, we participate in this ceremony of grievance and acceptance every day. How do we connect with our possessions now that they are glass? And how does our behavior change towards them? Personal memorabilia, soft toys, paraphernalia. The ceremony dissipates into normality, rituals, into habits. The continued use of these objects turn them from precious memorabilia into common items. We become careless with them, a fumble, and a shatter. As sure as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, the cycle of rehealing occurs every day. Gradually, we accept the new normal, a renewal. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Was that a sound check you had in the background deliberate? It sounded like. Was yeah. it? Yes, we recorded yeah, that. Was that. <laughs> no, that's really good. I was just thinking, I wasn't sure how intended. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Are you guys RMIT masters? Yes. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. I to say that beforehand. But mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt questions. We've got another um, two minutes of questions. So. Just, just a comment, really. The, the images are really um, beautiful, actually. The sort of conjuring of the domestic space and personal effects and ritual. Very, especially that one with the chime blowing in the rug and the glass. But it, it just also having watched what's been happening in Lebanon and the question around glass buildings uh, is interesting. I don't know if you know Lena Gottner's project in the city, which chooses mass over glass. So, Thanks. Um, I'll just make a quick comment. I think you guys did really well in terms of your graphics in mm. conveying your messages. So, like, congrats on that. You did awesome. Um, I just had a question for you in terms of reinforcing to us who your main, like, audience would be. Like, who do you expect to have these items mainly? So we kind of um, thought about... Um, the amount of possessions lost um, as a result of this blast. And a lot of people would probably be left without um, a lot of their own possessions. Um, so we thought that reforging these possessions in glass to these people who have lost um, um, their stuff is um, a kind of audience that, we, um, that would be given to them. But yet we also believe that um, perhaps if we were to support um, Lebanon in a way, in, in a monetary value maybe, that they were to purchase these items as well. Um, but um, generally it's the ceremony that's um, um, targeted to like um, everyone throughout, um, how unsustainable all the items that we have nowadays and how, you know, if there was an explosion suddenly, all these items suddenly become redundant and most of them are just left on the ground, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate how it's like a gift to the locals. You like showed a lot of empathy through this process. So yeah, good job.